Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, The Pennsylvania German in the French and Indian War, a historical sketch by Henry Melcher Muhlenberg Richards. This book was published all the way back in 1905. Now today we're going to read a chapter called The Powder in the Mine. It's going to tell of some of the events that led to the French and Indian War and why the Delawares and Shawnees were so angry and subsequently kept committing depredations and raids on the settlers of states like Virginia and Pennsylvania. For many years before the outbreak of the French and Indian War, the hapless Pennsylvania German settlers were sleeping over a loaded mine filled with inflammable powder. Many events and circumstances were forming the fuse to which it needed but the spark of the torch to start a flame of death and destruction, the horror of which even we of today can hardly realize. To the credit of William Penn, it must be said that he was the one man who ever treated the Indian with some degree of justice. From the standpoint of the times, he did what was right, and yet he drove a pretty good bargain when he purchased from the Indians their lands in the celebrated Treaty of 1682, and this they soon began to realize. With the advent of the Palatine settlers in the Tulpehocken region from 1723 to 1729 and their settlement on unoccupied lands, came the demand from the Delawares on June 5, 1728 for payment of the value of the ground from which they were gradually being forced. They were paid for it and were given all they asked, but as the unprejudiced reader scans the wording of the deed of 1732, we believe he will not be surprised to hear that it became one of the things in the memory of the Indian over which he did not love to dwell, as he took down his wigwam and turned his back forever on the lovely forests filled with game, the beautiful streams teeming with fish, and the sunny fields which for generations had been his home. Of far greater moment than the Treaty of 1732 was the celebrated walking purchase of Northampton County, where, under the protection of a treaty made by him in good faith, but unjustly carried out by his white neighbor, the Delaware Indian saw himself robbed of other fair acres of his land. This crime against his nation, as he considered it, was never forgotten. Another most just cause of complaints on the part of the Indian was the traffic in rum kept up among their people. Many efforts were made to induce the ruling powers to take such action as might prevent its sale to them, and in fact some action was taken. But unfortunately, rum was too valuable an ally to be lightly cast aside by the whites. In fairness, it must be said that almost from the beginning of the colony, the Society of France had thrown their influence against the iniquity of selling rum among the Indians. At one time, all such traffic was forbidden by statute. After the death of William Penn, an increasing number of complaints came up from the Delawares, and especially the Shawnees, in reference to the unrestrained traffic and liquor which unlicensed traders brought among them. Again and again did the Indians petition against the trade and the manner in which it was conducted. Unfortunately, their craving for drink was so great that whenever they experienced the effects of prohibitory law, they immediately begged that rum might be sold to them again. It is more than probable, however, that these latter requests were more or less inspired by the traders, whose business was very much impaired by the loss of the rum trade. These men, with their vile liquor, met the young members of the tribe returning from hunting and trapping, and by their bartering robbed the old men, the women, and children of the very necessities of life. To such an extent was this carried on that in 1731, Shikolemi gave the authorities of Pennsylvania to understand that friendly relations with the Six Nations could not exist unless the liquor trade with their subjects, the Delawares, and the Shawnees was regulated. However fairly the Indians may have been treated by Penn and by the authorities after him, yet it cannot be denied that in numerous instances, besides being cheated by the traders, they were greatly abused by the settlers, who never hesitated to take advantage of them. The life of an Indian was held very cheaply, and still more so his property. Were this the place for it, many pathetic and shameful instances might be given in evidence of this fact. 
All this rankled in the hearts of the injured person and in the memory of his friends, and in accordance with their nature they but waited the opportunity to balance the scale in their own manner with their white neighbors. By a strange turn in the wheel of fortune, when this opportunity came, the vengeance fell upon the heads of the Pennsylvania German settlers on the borderland, who of all men never injured the Indians by deed or word, and who alone were truly their friends. No matter how much injured, however, nor how greatly wronged, the Delaware Indians would have forgiven, if not forgotten, and the tale of bloodshed in Pennsylvania, which I have to relate, would never have been recounted had the authorities of the province cast in their lot with them instead of finally adhering to the Six Nations. It is hard to realize the hatred which the former bore towards those who called themselves their masters. The shame they felt as a conquered nation is evidenced by the tradition already related which shows how anxious they were to explain away in an honorable manner the cause of their vassalage. It was a deep wound which the proud Iroquois kept rankling. As the conquerors and masters of the Delawares, the Iroquois claimed ownership of all the lands in Pennsylvania which belonged to the former. The Treaty of 1732 with the Delawares had hardly been accomplished when the governor of Pennsylvania was made to realize that it would become necessary to placate the Six Nations by a present. It was with difficulty he succeeded in gathering together their representatives, and it was not until 1736 that the matter was finally settled. Two weeks after this deed had been signed, another was drawn covering all the claim of the Six Nations to the land drained by the Delaware River and south of the Blue Mountains. Since they had never until this day laid any specific claim to the lands on the Lower Delaware, the second deed becomes significant. It established the Iroquois' claim to all the lands owned by the Delaware Indians. This latter tribe were never willing to acknowledge the justice of the so-called walking purchase and refused to give up any land contrary to their understanding of the original treaty. To gain their point, the English had a conference with the Six Nations held in 1742, to which the Delawares were merely told they might come and attend, and after the usual presents were given in payment of lands about the Susquehanna, complained of the actions of the Delawares in refusing to vacate the land. It will not take much thought for the reader to realize with what feelings of anger and bitterness the hearts of the Delawares must have been filled. As they saw Canisetego, the Iroquois speaker, turned to the governor and heard him say, You informed us of the misbehavior of our cousins, the Delawares, with respect to their continuing to claim and refusing to remove from some land on the river Delaware. Notwithstanding their ancestors had sold it by deed under their hands and seals to the proprietors for a valuable consideration upwards of fifty years ago, and notwithstanding that they themselves had about five years ago, after a long and full examination, ratified that deed of their ancestors, and given a fresh one under their hands and seals, and then you requested us to remove them, enforcing your request with a string of wampum. Afterwards, you laid on the table by Conrad Weiser our own letters, some of our cousins' letters, and the several writings to prove the charge against our cousins, with a draft of the land in dispute. We now tell you that we have perused all these several papers. We see with our own eyes that they, the Delawares, have been a very unruly people, and are altogether in the wrong in their dealings with you. We have concluded to remove them and oblige them to go over the river Delaware and to quit all claim to any lands on this side for the future, since they have received pay for them, and it has gone through their guts long ago. To confirm to you that we will see your request executed, we lay down this string of wampum in return for yours. The Delawares were given no opportunity to defend themselves. Indeed, as soon as Canisetego had finished the above address to the governor, he turned to the Delawares and, taking a belt of wampum in his hand, spoke as follows. Cousins, let this belt of wampum serve to chastise you. You ought to be taken by the hair of the head and shaken severely till you recover your senses and become sober. You don't know what ground you are standing on or what you are doing. We have seen with our eyes a deed signed by nine of your ancestors above fifty years ago for this very land. But how came you to take upon yourselves to sell land at all? 
We conquered you. We made women of you. You know you are women and can no more sell land than women. Nor is it fit that you should have the power of selling land since you would abuse it. This land that you claim has gone through your guts. You have been furnished with clothes and meat and drink by the goods you pay for it. And now you want it again like children as you are. But what makes you sell land in the dark? Did you ever tell us that you had sold this land? Did we ever receive any part, even the value of a pipe shank for it? You have told us a blind story that you sent a messenger to inform us of the sale. But he never came amongst us, nor we never heard anything about it. This is acting in the dark, and very different from the conduct our six nations observe in their sales of land. On such occasions, they give public notice and invite all the Indians of their united nations and give them a share of the present they receive for their lands. This is the behavior of the wise united nations, but we find that you are none of our blood. You act a dishonest part, not only in this, but in other matters. Your ears are ever open to slanderous reports about our brethren. And for all these reasons, we charge you to remove instantly. We don't give you liberty to think about it. You are women. Take the advice of a wise man and remove immediately. You may return to the other side of the Delaware where you came from. But we don't know whether, considering how you have demeaned yourselves, you will be permitted to live there, or whether you have not swallowed that land down your throats as well as the land on this side. We therefore assign you two places to go, either to Wyoming or Shamakin. You may go to either of these places, and then we shall have you under our eye, and shall see how you behave. Don't deliberate, but remove away and take this belt of wampum. Conrad Weiser interpreted this into English, and Cornelius Spring turned the English into the Delaware tongue. While this rebuke was still smarting on the ears of the Delawares, Canisetego, taking up another belt of wampum, said to them, This serves to forbid you, your children, and grandchildren to the latest posterity for ever meddling in land affairs. Neither you nor any who shall descend from you are ever after to presume to sell any land, for which purpose you are to preserve this string in your memory of what your uncles have this day given you in charge. We have some other business to transact with our brethren, and therefore depart the council and consider what has been said to you. The Delaware sullenly withdrew to brood over their insults. So this happened back around 1742. This was an interesting case where the English had taken the part of the Iroquois, or the Six Nations, and the Iroquois chief, Canisetego, was rebuking the Delawares and basically taking the English aside and telling them to remove from Pennsylvania. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.